That's perfect. Let's talk about DeSantis and see where we're uh, where we're heading in this country. Oh, snap. DeSantis defends math textbook rejection as Dems seek proof of critical race theory lessons. Florida Education Department officials have not yet provided examples from the textbook textbooks deemed impermiss- impermissible, but on Monday released the list of books that failed to make the cut. So apparently, DeSantis defended it. We want kids to learn to think so they get the right answer, DeSantis told reporters. The Florida Department of Education on Friday rejected some 54 math books from state classrooms, a move that drew national attention when DeSantis claimed the proposals from publishing companies contained lessons on indoctrinating concepts like race essentialism. The move was just the latest example of Republicans, including DeSantis, scrutinizing what students are learning, blah, blah. Okay, here's the question. If the math books don't have critical race theory in them, why are they bent out of shape? They're getting removed. Hmm. If it's just a math book where it's like two plus two is four, then why, why, why would they be mad about that? They'd be like, oh, I guess, there, do we still have a math book that says two plus two equals four? Then why do we care if you remove that one? This is really interesting because it is possible that they're not actually teaching critical race theory. Oh, hold on, let me turn myself up. Um, and what they're doing is teaching a form of praxis, which is where critical theory is in everything. It doesn't have to be explicit. It underlies everything. I've seen some of these math problems. I think it was Matt Walsh earlier today who was reading some of these questions about Maya Angelou and all the stuff that went in on in her life, all this racism she stood up to. It's a math problem. You're supposed to be solving X and Y and A and B and all this stuff. But they're rolling into it all these ideas so that they can say, We're not teaching critical race theory. This is praxis. We've talked about this before. This is critical race applied principles. Right. So an an example would be those old math problems where it's like a train leaves Detroit traveling 500 miles an hour and a train leaves Pittsburgh traveling at 50 miles an hour and blah, blah, blah. And then, um, you know, that's a math problem. What they're doing in these is they're like, Johnny is a young white man who's 15 (laughs) 15 years old and he gets stopped by the police three times in one month. But Jerome is a young black man who gets stopped by the police 2,000 times in one month. Mm-hmm. What percentage of stops were? And then you're like, okay, we get it. That's what they're doing. Yeah, I, I honestly think, it, if anything, it doesn't go far enough. I, we, as far as DeSantis' move here, uh, I had to go pick up one of my kids. from. I have one kid in public school and the rest of mine are homeschooled. But uh, I had to go pick her up. And there was a, a class. The kids must have been maybe seven years old. And all across the wall is the, you know, rainbow flags and uh, trans flag. Now, nothing said, you know, anything about, but but the coloring is all the right coloring, you know, and there's like the little sneaky words, you know, like sharing is caring, like Care Bears type stuff. And this is in a tiny town in, in Idaho, in the mountains of Idaho. I mean, tiny. That's so it's everywhere and it's it's like being pumped into these kids brains i actually think like that's why colors are so important you know kids like latch on to that stuff and it's very visually appealing for them so when it's broadcast in their faces all the time you don't have to have an explicit message in there the message is like in the image i still remember an image like in fourth grade on my wall of the of a horn like a trumpet playing music and it showed the sound waves coming out like this like round uh, sorry if you're listening you're not able to see but then then the teacher came in one day was like actually the sound waves are actually like this and they changed the image of, to a sine wave mm-hmm. and that was that sticks with me to today that was like 35 years ago or something crazy yeah. Imagery is the most one of the most powerful ways to teach a child anything. Sound, imagery, smell, those kind of things. Yeah, sensory stuff. There totally. are a bunch of these videos that are coming out, and it's starting to expose what these teachers <coughs> are doing. One of them is the um, like a gender flow chart almost. Yeah. <clears throat> and there's it's from Libs of TikTok. I saw this, where the teacher's like, you start with your 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 sexuality, and then you can go as far as you want towards male or female, and then you come down to your identity, and it can be different. And it's like. It's not, the thing is, if you tell a kid, trans people exist, gay people exist, it's like, okay, I get it. You're telling them they exist. If you give them a card and tell them to draw on a scale where they are, now you're, you're, you're actually not just telling them exist. Now you're doing some kind of litmus test for them and their identity. And what happens then if these kids feel like they're not going to fit in if they go with the bland gray flag, the... The cis flag they've been showing kids is just black and white. Hmm. So why would a kid pick that one? Mm-hmm. Why would the kid want to be the, the you know, mm-hmm. boring? No, you can be fun and exciting. Here, do these things. And so these kids don't understand oppression. They don't understand civil rights. These are, these are young kids between, you know, uh, five years old and nine years old. They're being told just to draw how they feel. And they're like, whatever. 
Don't you think they're going after them for because at that age they don't understand sexuality at all? They don't have, you know, they're not they're prepubescent and all of this. So if you go after them then and you like start talking to them about sexual orientation, of course, like Johnny and Jack are going to say that they like each other more because girls are stupid and icky or whatever. Mm. So then when they do start to develop actual hormones and feelings, you're just like adding layers of confusion because now they're getting all the you know testosterone's flowing they're like well i thought i liked you know jack it turns out maybe Yo, jill's all right you know i've i've heard some horror stories from these, these are coming out of conservative states where like someone's kid said that they thought they were pan and their parent was like why do you think you're pan and they're like because i like everybody and they're like you you like everybody that means you want to kiss them and and, the, and their daughter was like no she's and they're, friendly yeah, I just mean like I want to be friends with them. And they're like, that's not what that means. Yeah. They're lying to those kids. I'm not saying it's every classroom, but certainly that is happening because these kids don't know what that means. And there's no way it gets to that level of teaching that they don't know that they're confusing them. And that's the worst part about exactly. it is that it's being obfuscated intentionally, uh, partially because they know the kids aren't old enough to really process what that means. And partially just everything that you don't say is every, every, is every bit as important as what you choose to say. And what you leave out says almost more about it than what you put in and that's that's terrifying to me yeah well i think it's i, th I think reality is yeah these, these teachers are indoctrinating kids and then the media is doing everything in its power to to push back so ibram x candy recently came out and said that uh, oh no they're grooming kids to be white supremacists and it's like wow it's working <laughs> if he's got to come out and try and do that the messaging has worked you've got candy trying to retake the word groomer because they're grooming kids it ain't gonna work buddy no nope. Did you cover the the first grade teacher who like told like told the first grade class that when when babies are born that they just guess the doctor just guesses whether it's a boy or a girl? Oh yeah, I think we talked about Did that. Talk right? about that. I don't remember that. They that, just guess. They just that they just told because the doctor just guesses. That's what happens. There's another video from Libs of TikTok where the doctor's basically saying that where it's like it's typically based on their their you know their their genetics and their genitals, but usually it's just their genitals and sometimes they're wrong. Ugh. It's wow. like, well. Sometimes as in like, you know, point zero seven zero yeah. <laughs> percent of the time. Yeah. But this is why ethics is so important. Science can only get you so far. You can only you can only look at pieces and parts and decide your final answer. But I mean, and that's I think maybe the, the conversation about ethics and emotions has gone kind of too far in one direction where it's like if you feel like you're a different sex, then then that's reality because we have not been having much talk about emotions. So this is like the, the hammers coming swinging back. I feel like society's really detached from its emotional self. How often do you see people cry? How often do you see people publicly acknowledging their suffering? Well, I mean, you could kids that used to have, even though they weren't living on a farm or whatever, they used to know people that were farmers. They had a grandfather that was a farmer or, you know, an uncle or whatever. And so they were involved with animal husbandry and that stuff at, at a younger age. And you don't have to explain like kids, ranch kids don't get birds and the bees talks mm. because they've been breeding animals, you know, being they've been around animals who are being bred since they were very, very young. So they, there's an implicit understanding there. Like dad doesn't have to sit down and say, you know, when a mama bee loves a daddy bee, you know, it's like they've been seeing stud horses and mares out in the pasture. Mm. Chickens. You know, chickens. Yeah. 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 Like we got we got Chicken City and I was Ooh. thinking about this, too. Um a lot of people talk about how their kids will watch Chicken City. Their dogs and their cats obviously will watch it too. But Chicken City has become this massive success. Thank you, everybody. But no, in all seriousness, the uh, you know, you'll get kids watching with their parents and they'll be like, I want to feed the chickens. And so they'll put the five bucks in, the, the food comes down, and then you'll see the rooster mount the hen and you know do his rooster business. <laughs> okay, you have to if, explain that. Well, I mean, it's this this Chicken City is, is overtly over the top family friendly. Chickens do these things. Like if you want to teach your kids about farms and petting zoos, you're going to watch that stuff happen. Sure. Now, maybe if your kids never been exposed to that, you're going to have to have that conversation. But to your point that, that I was thinking about this earlier, I was like, kid who grows up on a goat farm is never going to have that question because they're like a little kid watching the goats do their thing. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's just totally true. And the chicken thing might be a little bit hard because then it's like, wait, so we're eating chicken babies? That's what we're eating? You know? <laughs> a lot of questions. Like, oh, wow, yeah. Yeah, yep. Every day those eggs come out. It's not necessarily a baby. <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, you don't eat the chicks. You got to wait for them to grow. That's where you get the meat. Do you guys have a farm? Yeah. Uh, do you, did you explain to your kids about like we're raising the animals, we're going to eat the animals or anything like that? Oh, I mean, yeah, no, I don't know. It just kind of happens. My, In fact, my little sister, when she was – 
she was probably 10 years old or so maybe oh she was younger than that seven or eight years old anyway she come come home from school and got off the school bus and i was out feeding her something and i came around and she and uh i just come in the back door and i hear her yell hey mom i'm hungry i want to eat bob <laughs> it, was like, it was this it was this steer that she'd named bob you know and she loved the steer or whatever but she's like whatever it's food food <laughs> <laughs> like, he's cute and everything but we're gonna eat him so i not not as, it's another one of those things just kind of implicit i don't think you imagine have to. being bob yeah, yeah right <laughs> yeah, i know that name do they do they like uh, argue against naming them for that reason uh, no i'm i mean uh my stepfather used to hate it but i like for me personally I, it doesn't bother me at all like yesterday i was at my in-laws uh getting ready to come well, easter and then getting ready to come out here and as soon as I left, we had a, one of our heifers calved, you know, and my wife comes home. She's like, oh, look at it. It's so cute. You know, like, I mean, thank goodness I didn't have to pull it or anything. But, you know, she's talking about how cute these little Angus calves are or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. And then, you know, the kids are hearing her talk like that. But they never they never have a problem, you know, eating like they know it's a cow. I guess yeah, when you're raised from steer. the beginning with that, you would just know from the tiniest age. Yeah, I think you're just closer to it or something. This is this is interesting because we we we've asked many times like who would who is going to survive better in the apocalypse or who is more likely to survive a conservative, rural, or urban liberal, and lot it's like no one thinks the urban liberals are going to make it. But this is a really good point we don't we we've not brought up. It's that people who grow up in rural areas are more likely to have been exposed at a young age to slaughtering a pig or a chicken to eat, like you know. I want to eat Bob. People in the city are going to be like, I have to do what with the knife? And then what do I do with those things? <laughs> yeah. They're not going to want to do it. They want to walk into a supermarket where there's just pink slime. And they can just, you know, cook it and eat it. We had a, a farm. My de my grandpa's, my grandpa's a cousin had a farm, northeast Ohio. We would go out there, Alvin, Uncle Alvin, and uh, Cousin Alvin. And then we you see the, 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 whole, the thing hanging upside down, like the cattle thing, just the, all the blood, all the skin ripped off. And it's like, wow, wow. And they, I don't think I ever watched them butcher it up. And I never saw them kill it. I did see my dad kill some, kill a groundhog. And that was, well, he, he family friendly, he wounded the groundhog and it escaped. And I just saw the trail of blood and it was Ooh. really disturbing. Mm -hmm. I thought, why, why hunt if you're not going to, like, why would Groundhogs you wound it? Groundhogs destroy houses. Yeah, I, you know, there's, there's always like, there's a reason, about it. but it was pretty tragic to see it get wounded and get away because I was like, what's going to happen? And he was like, well, it's going to die in a hole somewhere. You get eaten yeah. or die in a hole. Yeah, the thing about groundhogs is that mm. they knock trees down. They can destroy houses. They can destroy foundations. So I was reading about it, and apparently there are some places where if you actually catch the groundhog, you have to kill it. Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Because you can, you can be liable for the damage it caused after you've caught it. I did not wow. know that. Crazy, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, like imagine, imagine you catch it, and they're like, oh, I don't want to hurt the little thing. So you just bring it to the edge of your property and let it go, and it goes yeah. to your neighbor's house and knocks a tree down. They're going to be like, you, you released that thing on me. Yeah, someone mentioned that about mice. They're like, if you don't do something with them, they will come back and they'll get worse. And I was going to say that I think that maybe one of the best things about living on a ranch is that you can teach your kids about the circle of life. Like if something does crawl in a hole and die, then other things come along and eat it. It becomes part of the soil. It's all part of like growing plants and all this really, it's actually really a neat cycle that I think kids would benefit from knowing about these things are hard because we have led such like kind of privileged and cushioned lives we can go to the store and get these little pink things that are they're chicken where did it come from we don't know milk grows on the shelves it's absolute insanity we have no connection to the things we eat it's a good opportunity to teach kids about that kind of cycle really important would you butcher at the farm yeah i butcher all our stuff yeah i do yeah i do my own butchering yeah, uh, in fact, it, this t this discussion made me think of a, my, my friend Shani. She always says that cows are friends and steers are food, which mm. is true. You know, yeah. like cows have more babies and you eat the steers and keep your replacement heifers and sell some off. And so anyway, so there is kind of a, li a little bit of bifurcation that's worth talking about. Like the the cows themselves are actually in a in a occupy a different place. It's because you keep them comfortable, so they have healthy babies and they produce good milk. Well, I mean, you want to keep them all comfortable, ideally, because you want you know you want to as much pound on the animal as you can when you go to to butcher. And and if they're stressed out, the meat can be bad, right? Mm. Uh, yeah. I mean, really, stress is more just like they'll have a harder time gaining weight. At least that's been. Yeah. Now, like if you're hunting, there. Yeah. If you if you if you wound something, it's going to get a hit of neuroepinephrine, and then your meat is going to be more tense and stiffer or uh, tough. Oh, wow. Saying. So, yeah. So, you, so when you're hunting, you want, it, you want the animal to go to be, like, in the head, just down. Yeah. Well, yeah, killed as quickly as possible. Like, And then there are some arguments people will make that, uh, like, an arrow – 
through, and I've seen it a bunch of times, and an arrow through the actual like boiler room with the vitals. The animal almost, I mean, they'll run off, but you can tell that they have no idea what happened. You know, they're just like, then they just die. Oh, wow. So. Oh, okay. So then they don't get the. There's not a big loud sound associated with it. It's just a sharp pain and then they're done. That's because so it's an arrow? Was... Yeah, broadhead, you know, it's just a clean cut and the bow doesn't make a lot of noise. And so I've heard this argument. I don't know how much, I don't know how much like bro science is going on there, but I mean, it's, I think it's a. It's a viable argument, I think. So, know. like, when you, when when they realize they're in danger, they tense up, and then the muscle becomes stiff and hard, and then you try to eat it. It's like you get it. Yeah, I think the big hit, just the big hit of adrenaline. Yeah, you know, going through and stiffens them up. Yeah, and and then you know, of course, like if you hit something in the guts or whatever, then that's a whole another. You kind of see know. that with factory farming when they lead the cattle into the bolt thing where they're going to put the bolt in their head, and then you watch the one behind it hear the the one in front of it die, and it, they freak out. Sure. So that's got to be affecting the final meat, the meat. It's, I mean, I feel like I'm almost disassociated. I don't know. I have, I'm a weird, empathetic creature. Sometimes. Happy cows, man. Yeah. Happy cows. Happy But uh, cows aren't, aren't raised for beef. It's just their, their dairy. And then what the steers are, the beef cattle. Or uh, cow, uh, yeah. 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 So cows are kind of, yeah. Cows are the females, right. And they are going to reproduce, you know, so you turn your bulls in depending on your setup, you turn your bulls in for some people leave them in all the time, but you know, you turn your bulls in for X amount of months and then, you know, you pull your bulls out. And then like right now at home, most of us are calving or almost done calving, which is just having the babies, you know, yeah. and then you, uh, you'll wean cows and calves, you know, later on. And that's when they'll go to auction. You know, so how, how long does it take them. for a, a calf to grow up to so become it, either food or it depends on your setup, whether you're running a cow calf operation or you're you're running a feed operation or just like buying ballers or steers and uh, it depends on what you're doing. But like, let's just say just for roundabout, let's just say eight months ish, then you go to auction or keep your replacement. Heifers but, so if, if, if I wanted milk, right. Mm -hmm. And I bought day one, just born calf, how long until it can, you know, work with the ball to make, start producing milk and getting the baby and everything. I see. Uh, usually breed heifers around two years old, two years. Yeah. Wow. Can they, are there any, are they able to in, inbreed like chickens? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, you castrate all the, the bulls, right? So you just have, Oh, I see what you're saying. Dad, Yes, daughter. exactly. Uh, yeah, I mean, you try to avoid that where you can, but sure. But you, and some you, people will line breed. You castrate the bulls? Well, the bull calves, you know. So when you, you don't want them, because you only want one to be breeding with them, or what? Yeah, well, yeah, you don't you don't want a nine month old or so bull calf out there breeding your heifers or whatever. Right, and, right, right, right. Plus, you know, just makes better meat so there's like right so there's specific specific bulls will be left not castrated castrated but like right yeah but. you'll pull those out and put them in their own pen and then huh. and those yeah. are the studs Pretty, yeah basically yeah that's a great name thanks for checking out this segment from the tim cast irl podcast but if you want to check out the full show live tune in monday through friday at 8 p.m and if you want more special access content, head over to TimCast.com and become a member. Your membership helps sustain this company, keep our journalists employed, makes this show happen, and you will get access to exclusive members-only segments of the TimCast IRL podcast. And there's a massive library to check out. So again, go to TimCast.com or tune in Monday through Friday at 8 p.m. And we'll see you all there.